Good morning. Good morning. And welcome to Zion. It is a joy and a gift and a blessing to be together in God's house. And it is such a gift and a privilege for me to be here with you today. I got back from Rwanda this past Tuesday evening, and my time there was just such a wonderful time. We, uh, as these numbers have faces, celebrated two classes of graduates. The first time we've been able to celebrate since 2019 because of the pandemic. And so we celebrated 28 students who graduated in uh, 2021 and 19 graduates who just graduated within the last few weeks and welcomed 25 new students uh, into our program. And so it was a joy to meet the new students and to celebrate with those students. If you will permit me, can I share just two stories with you about our students, two of our students? I am always awed by our students, and it's such a blessing to be able to come alongside them and help them pursue their dreams. So in the course of our, our celebration, it started at one and didn't end until eight, and there's singing and dancing and poems and speeches and gift giving, and then a, a big feast to, to finish it all off. But one of our students, Lydia, uh, got up, and uh, Lydia's older sister, Esther, had also been part of our program. She graduated in 2019. And when I first met them, um, I was humbled by their poverty. Poor than poor. When Esther and Lydia were growing up, they never ate every day. It would often be two or three days between meals. And finding school fees was incredibly difficult. They were just very, very poor. And uh, their father disappeared during the time of the genocide, most likely murdered. Um, one of the tactics those committing the genocide used was to release from prison men known to have AIDS and then pay them to rape. And Esther and Lydia's mother experienced that horror, and she's HIV positive as a result. But she has a light in her eyes, and the joy of Jesus exudes from her like you would believe. At any rate, Lydia got up and, and talked about how much she and her sister and her mother appreciated what these numbers and faces had done for them. She, my sister's life is different because of these numbers and faces. My life has been changed, and my mother's life is much better as a result. We have both now have good jobs and we're able to help our mom and so on. And she she finished her speech by saying. I would not be who I am today if it weren't for these numbers have faces. This is a story I must tell my children and my grandchildren. And I found myself in tears. When somebody says this is their story is a story they must tell their children and grandchildren. The difference that has happened in their lives. That's pretty powerful. Another one of our graduates in birth is Marie Giselle. And Marie Giselle is uh, this beautiful, quiet, shy little young woman. And when I first met her several years ago, uh, I used to take our students pre-pandemic, I would take them out in small groups to have lunch and get to know them better. And uh, Marie Giselle was in one of those small groups and I asked her just to share her story with me and I was not prepared at all for this story. So she told me when she was three years old, and that's when the genocide occurred. And she had a baby sister, a toddler, and an older sister, mom and dad, and they're fleeing the murderers, running and fleeing the murderers, and people around them are dying. And they're trying to get into the rainforest in Congo. And mom and older sister get separated and they never see them again. Assume they were murdered. Right? So dad and the two youngest girls continue to flee the Congo. They make it into the rainforest. They hide in the rainforest. They're eating grubs or whatever they can find for, for weeks, just hiding. And then they decide it's really still not safe to go back to Rwanda. So they settle in a uh, Congolese village in that rainforest. 
dad's really distraught, wanting to know what happened to his wife and his older daughter. So he decides to leave the two little girls in the care of this Congolese woman and go back to Rwanda to try to find out what happened to his wife. He leaves, never heard from again. Probably murdered him again. So Marie Giselle shares with me, she says, I, all I could think about as a child was getting back to Rwanda, trying to find my parents or find out what happened to them. So when she's eight, picture this. How old is Nelson? Six. Six. Think about a little girl two years older than her, right? She gets in her head, she's going to take her baby sister, who's like five, and flee and try to get back into Rwanda. So she wakes up at night, wakes up her sister, runs away, and they have no legal papers to get back into Rwanda, so she sneaks across the border at night. It takes them a couple of weeks, didn't eat at all for those two weeks, just running and hiding and running and hiding. Finally makes it to a Rwandan village, <clears throat> starts knocking on doors, please, please help us, please, please help us. Finally a man opens the door and welcomes them in and he asks them their name and, and Marie Giselle shares her name and Miracle of Miracles is an uncle. An uncle who hadn't seen her since she was an infant and had never seen a baby sister. Second Miracle of Miracles, Mom and older sister are alive and in a village two villages over and they get reunited. But as a young girl, Marie Giselle experienced so much trauma and saw so much death and murder, right? And you look at her today, this quiet, gentle woman with a light in her eyes. But because of that trauma, she decided she wanted to be a doctor, right? That was her dream. Next month, she finishes her clinicals. She's graduated from the university. It's a six-year program to become a doctor in Rwanda. She's finishing her clinicals in July. She got married last year. She's having a baby in July as well. And I put my arm around her, and she just gave me a big hug, and she said, I wouldn't be where I am without these numbers in our faces. I wouldn't have been able to achieve my dream of caring for people showing compassion to people and healing people from the trauma in their lives if it weren't for these numbers and faces. So thank you, Zion and Zion Endowment Fund. You support one of our students, and your prayers are, are such a blessing for us. And as I said, I'm just always awed by our students and their patience and their persistence and their resilience. And I could tell a whole lot more stories, but we should be this is God's house. He's invited us into his presence to speak to us, to bless us, to embrace us, and to shower his love upon us. And so we do. We rise for confession and absolution. One last comment. This is Rwandan Retainer Club. Yeah. So. Confession and absolution. Beloved, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have done undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors and ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways 
to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Beloved, in the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us. And for his sake, God forgives us all our sins. To those who believe in Jesus Christ, he gives the power to become the children of God and bestows on them the Holy Spirit. May the Lord, who has begun this good work in us, bring it to completion in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We rise and join the entrance hymn. Come into the name of the Father and of the Son 
and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again 
to a yoke of slavery. For you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not, you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other, to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law, and those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. The word of the Lord.
Grace, mercy, and peace is ours this day because of Jesus the Christ. My brothers and sisters in Christ, today is the third Sunday of Pentecost. Today we continue our transition into this second half of the church year, into this season of Pentecost. The first half of the church year, with its seasons of Advent and Christmas, Epiphany, Lent, and Easter, focuses our attention on the life and ministry of Jesus. Now, with this six-month-long season of Pentecost, we shift our focus away from the life and ministry of Jesus to what it means to live our lives as Christ followers. How does the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus change us and transform us? And today, our readings remind us that living our lives as Christ followers isn't always easy. To be sure, the benefits of being a Christ follower are absolutely wonderful. Forgiveness, life, salvation. But there are also costs. In fact, we as Christ followers are called to count the costs. So, beloved, let's dig deeper. Our Old Testament reading this morning from the first book of Kings, the 19th chapter. But to understand the story here in chapter 19, we really need to understand what happened in the previous chapter. In chapter 18, we have the story of Elijah's big confrontation with the prophets of Baal at Mount Carmel. You may remember Elijah challenging the prophets of Baal to build an altar, to pile it high with wood, to create an animal sacrifice and place it on that altar, and then to call on Baal to come and consume that sacrifice with fire. Prophets of Baal thought this was a great, great idea, a wonderful opportunity. So, they build an altar. They pile it high with wood. They slaughter a bull and cut it in pieces and place it on top of that altar. And then they pray for Baal to come and consume their sacrifice with fire. But do you remember what happened? Nothing happens. So they prayed some more. And nothing happened. And so they prayed even more loudly. And still, nothing happened. So they danced around the altar. And still, nothing happens. In fact, no matter how much they pray, no matter how loudly they pray, no matter how much they dance, absolutely nothing happens. And Elijah begins to taunt them. Shout louder! Surely Baal is a god. Perhaps he's just deep in thought or busy or traveling. Or maybe he's sleeping and he just needs to be waked up. And still, nothing happens. Finally, it's Elijah's turn. So he too builds an altar. He too piles it high with wood. He too slaughters a bull and lays it on top of the wood. But just to raise the ante a bit, he digs a trench around his altar and drenches the sacrifice and the wood and the altar with water until that trench is full of water. And he does this not just once, but three times. And then he prays to the Lord to come with consuming fire, and the Lord dies. Then Elijah has the prophets of Baal seized and put to death. What an incredibly dramatic victory for Elijah, prophet of the one true God. 
But needless to say, King Ahab and his wife Jezebel, who are patrons of Baal, are not too happy about all of this. So Elijah, afraid for his life, flees to a cave on Mount Korah. And there in that cave, God comes to Elijah and asks, What are you doing here, hiding in this cave? And Elijah says, I've been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I'm the only one left. And now they're trying to kill me too. Then God tells Elijah to leave the cave and go outside because he's about to pass by. Now, beloved, that phrase, pass by, is an incredibly powerful one throughout all of Scripture. Every time God passes by, he reveals himself in some profound way. Here, first there's wind, then there's an earthquake, then there's fire. But God does not reveal himself in any of these as he passes by. Instead, there comes a still, small voice, a gentle whisper. In Hebrew, it's literally a gentle silence, a silence so deep you can hear it. And this is where God chooses to reveal himself as he passes by, in gentle silence. God uses this gentle silence to encourage Elijah to stop running away from his ministry, to stop avoiding what God has called him to do. Beloved, being faithful isn't always easy. There's a cost. And sometimes that cost might even be death. The day will come when God will send his own son into the world to pay the ultimate cost on our behalf. He will die on a cross for your sins and mine, for the sins of the whole world. And he will do so willingly. The cost is great, death by crucifixion, but the benefits are glorious. Forgiveness, life, and salvation, now and for all eternity. So God tells Elijah to stop hiding, to leave this cave behind. He's got more work for Elijah to do. God himself is putting things in motion to deal with King Ahab and Jezebel, to deal with unfaithful Israel. Their sin will be judged. So in our reading this morning, Elijah is told to anoint Hazael to be king of Aram, which is also known as Syria, and he's told to anoint Jehu to be king of Israel, and finally he's told to anoint Elisha to be his successor as God's prophet. Jehu will put to death any who escaped the sword of Hazael, and Elisha will put to death any who escaped the sword of Jehu. Yet I reserve 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed down to Baal, and whose mouths have not kissed him. And beloved, that's exactly what Elijah does. He anoints Elisha to be his student and successor. Then after a bit, he will send Elisha to anoint Hazael and Jehu. And together, these three will be God's instruments in judging sin and preserving the faithful. No, living a life of faith isn't always easy. There are wonderful, grace-filled benefits to be sure. But there is also a cost if we're going to live our lives faithful to the one who saves us. And that, my beloved, brings us to our gospel reading this morning in Luke chapter 9. Here, too, we see both the benefit 
and the cost of following Jesus. Our reading this morning begins with Luke telling us, as the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set his face toward Jerusalem. Jesus is more than ready to finish his mission and head home to heaven. The time has come to die. The time has come to leave the grave behind empty. The time has come to return home to heaven, to sit at the Father's right hand as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. The benefits of what's coming are huge, but the cost is great. But the time has come to, to bring all of this to its mercy-filled, grace-filled consummation. So they leave Galilee and head for Jerusalem. And they take the most direct route to get to Jerusalem as quickly as possible. And that means going through Samaria. They're about to finish their first day's journey. So Jesus sends some messengers into the village ahead to find lodging and food. Remember, there are no Ramada inns. There are no McDonald's. Travelers have to rely on the hospitality of the villagers. They have to rely on people welcoming them into their homes. And coming into this small village with a sizable group of disciples, just how many we don't know, requires some significant hospitality. But this tiny Samaritan village wants nothing to do with Jesus. They want nothing to do with his disciples. And for all kinds of reasons. First, the feud between Jews and Samaritans is so bitter that the idea of offering hospitality to Jews is an incredibly bitter pill to swallow. In fact, Josephus, the historian, tells us that it wasn't all that uncommon for Samaritans to harass Jews traveling through Samaria to Jerusalem. And on many occasions, they even murdered them. But there's something else going on here, I think. The Samaritans know about Jesus. They know about his miracles. They know about his teaching. They've heard people say, he just might be the Messiah. But Jesus rarely spent any time with the Samaritans. Most of the time, he was just passing through. And so they feel snubbed by him. They feel ignored by him. Why should they welcome someone who really doesn't seem to care all that much about them? Why? Why hadn't Jesus spent any significant time with them? So they want nothing to do with Jesus. Beloved, notice what happens next. James and John are deeply offended by this rejection. Remember their nickname? In Greek, it's Boanerges, sons of thunder. So they want to call down fire and brimstone to destroy this Samaritan village, to burn this village to the ground. Notice, beloved, this animosity between Jews and Samaritans goes in both directions. And James and John expect Jesus to applaud their desire for destruction. But to their chagrin, to their surprise, instead of applauding them, Jesus rebukes them. Following Jesus has benefits, but there's a very real cost, too. And Luke then goes on to give us three more examples of this. And in all three examples, each person has good intentions. They can see the benefits of following Jesus. It's just that they don't know the cost of being a Christ follower. In the first example, an unnamed man says to Jesus, I'll follow you wherever you go. And Jesus says, 
foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Remember what just happened to Jesus and his followers? They were rejected by that Samaritan village. There was no hospitality, no place to sleep for the night, no food to eat. But notice, beloved, Jesus does not reject this man at all. He doesn't reject this man's offer to follow him. On the other hand, nor does he accept it. He simply states the reality of being a Christ follower. Being a Christ follower means our focus is proclaiming the kingdom of God, whatever it takes and wherever it takes us. So in essence, Jesus is asking this man, are you ready? Are you willing to live an itinerant life with me to grow God's kingdom? Are you willing to give up the security of your home, the security of your current lifestyle for the sake of God's kingdom? So, beloved, given Jesus' response to this man, does he still follow Jesus? Luke doesn't tell us. We don't know. In a second example, Jesus himself invites a man to come and follow him. But this man says he must first bury his father. Then he can leave and follow Jesus. Now in Jewish culture, burying a relative is more important than just about anything else. In fact, the rabbis said that burying a relative is more important than studying the Torah, more important than attending worship in the temple, and even more important than observing circumcision on the eighth day. So this man's request isn't unreasonable. This is an urgent need. This is a critical family responsibility. And yet Jesus says, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. At first, these words seem so harsh. Beloved, it really is okay to bury the dead. This is indeed an urgent need. But proclaiming the kingdom of God is even more urgent. In fact, it's the most urgent, the most important of all. Once more, beloved, notice Jesus does not reject this man, nor does he accept him. He simply states the reality of being a Christ follower. Again, being a Christ follower means our focus is proclaiming the kingdom of God, whatever it takes and wherever it takes us. So in essence, Jesus is asking this man, are you ready? Are you willing to leave everything behind, even the urgent things behind, to focus your life on what is truly urgent, truly important? So again, given Jesus' response to this man, does he still follow Jesus? Luke doesn't tell us. We just don't know. Finally, in the third example, another man says to Jesus, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. Now again, this isn't necessarily a bad thing. In fact, Elisha, in our Old Testament reading this morning, asks the very same thing. And Elijah lets him go and say his goodbye. But here... Jesus seems to sense in this person a reluctance to leave everything behind to follow Jesus. So Jesus says, no one who has put a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. Christ followers simply cannot be turned around backwards, always looking in the wrong direction. Christ followers are called to keep their eyes looking forward. You can't plow a straight furrow if you're always looking backward, always looking in the wrong direction. 
And you can't grow God's kingdom if you're always looking backward, always looking in the wrong direction. In the words of Paul to the Philippians, one thing I do, forgetting what's behind and straining toward what's ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. And again, in the words of Hebrews, let's throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. So one last time, beloved, given Jesus' response to this man, does he still follow Jesus? Again, Luke doesn't tell us. Again, we just don't know. Beloved, I think Luke intentionally leaves these three little stories open-ended. I think he wants us to think through for ourselves both the benefits and the costs of being Christ followers here in this place at this time. Will we follow? And that, my beloved, brings us at last to our epistle reading this morning in Paul's letter to the Galatians, the fifth chapter. Here Paul gives us a wonderful description of what being a Christ follower really looks like. First of all, being a Christ follower means recognizing our gospel freedom. Because of Jesus, we are no longer slaves to the law. The law can't save us. Only the good news of Jesus saves us. The law shows us our sin. The gospel shows us our Savior and everything he's done for us. Beloved, hear these powerful words from Paul. For freedom, for freedom, Christ set us free. Jesus, through his life, death, and resurrection, freed us from sin, death, and Satan so that we can experience what it really means to be free in Christ, so that we can exercise our gospel freedom in Christ each and every day. In fact, Paul calls us this morning to stand firm in our gospel freedom. But beloved, our freedom in Christ doesn't mean we can just do whatever we want. Our gospel freedom is like winning the lottery. It's a great, great blessing if it's used rightly, but it's an incredible curse if it's not used rightly. Our gospel freedom comes with incredible benefits, but there's also a cause. Our gospel freedom comes with deep, deep responsibility. As Christ followers, we don't indulge ourselves. Rather, as Christ followers, we're called to live a life of love for others. We love those around us in the very same way we've been loved by Jesus wholeheartedly and unconditionally. Love your neighbor as yourself, quotes Paul. Our gospel freedom is the full expression, the full exercise of love. And the beauty of it all is that the Holy Spirit poured into our lives in our baptism equips and empowers us to live this life of gospel freedom. The Holy Spirit equips and empowers us to live this life of wholehearted and unconditional love. Beloved, we walk by the Spirit. We walk by the Spirit, leaving the sinful desires of the flesh behind. These desires of the flesh, sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like, hurt not just ourselves, but all those around us as well. 
Instead, the power of the Holy Spirit produces in us the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. These are the things that bring blessing into our lives and into the lives of those around us. So as Christ followers, we gladly count the cost. We gladly crucify. We gladly put to death our fleshly desires so that we can live by the Spirit, so that we can walk with the Spirit, living lives full of mercy and grace and love. Yes, there are costs for being Christ follower. But oh, beloved, what wonderful benefits. Amen? Amen. We rise and join together in telling the story of our faith using the Apostles' Creed. God has made us his people through our baptism into Christ. Living together in trust and hope, we confess our faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life of the last. Beloved, let's pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their need. Pray, gracious God, we come to you this morning so thankful for our gospel freedom, so thankful for what Jesus has done for us, setting us free from sin, death, and salvation. And we pray that you would pour your Holy Spirit into our minds even more so that we might indeed experience and live the fruits of the Spirit, beginning with love and ending with self-control. Lord, in your mercy, yeah. oh Lord, we pray this day for the church throughout the world. There are people throughout the world who are experiencing discrimination and persecution because of their faith in you. We pray that you would hold them close with a hedge of protection around them and empower their ministry so that every man, woman, and child on this planet indeed knows about you and what you've done for us. Lord, in your mercy. We pray this day for those in need, whether it be a body or spirit or soul. We pray for Brian and Mitch and Kurt and Tracy, for Bill Francis and his family who are still recovering a little bit from COVID, for Sarah Wallen's daughter Karen and her cousin Richard, for Christy Farman's son Matt, and for Aaron's heart, go on gold. And uh, we pray that you would hold each of these people close to your heart and touch them with your healing hand. We pray for the homebound, for Dolly and Vivian and Helen and Mark and Lee. Again, hold them close to your heart. Let them know that you love them deeply. Use the caregivers, the family, and us, their dying family, to love them with the love of you. Lord, in your mercy, we pray for our world. There is so much craziness going on. There's so much polarization. There's so much anger and animosity. Oh, Lord, use us to be people. 
peacemaker. To be people who stand in the gap and love people at both poles, unquestionably, unconditionally, <laughs> and wholeheartedly. Use us, O oh Lord, in this time of need. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Finally, O oh Lord, we pray for our leaders, our president, our Congress, our Supreme Court, our city legislators, our leaders, <coughs> our local leaders. Give them wisdom. Help them to use their authority and make decisions that are good and right and just for all. Lord, in your mercy. In your hands, O oh Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy and grace through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. <coughs> our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Let us pray. Almighty and merciful God, we have again worship in your presence and receive both forgiveness for our many sins and the assurance of your love in Jesus Christ. We thank you for this undeserved grace and ask you to keep us in faith until we inherit eternal salvation through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with the smile of his favor and give you. six Sundays fulfilling previous obligations. I will miss you deeply, but I will be in the office every Tuesday, and I will be on call if there's a need. Please do not hesitate to call me day or night, all right, if there's a need. And I know you'll be in good hands with Pastor Christian, Christian, Pastor Christian. And uh, I look forward to being back with you in the office for a couple of Sundays. Take note in the bulletin about the need from uh, Community Dinner Portland and uh, the upcoming Mind Box Sunday, next Sunday. All right. There are no other. Uh, yes, I knew there had to be another announcement. Uh, I know you were waiting ten minutes, but I'm not here. If any of you are wondering about the details of the number nine and six, some people. So thankful for our ministry together and the various forms and shapes it takes. May God bless us this week. We rise and join together in the sending hymn. 